And I'm really excited today to introduce to you uh, Antero Garcia, who is an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education. And if any of you have wondered, suppose I study games, am I going to find a place to publish my research on games? Professor Garcia is proof that yes, in fact, there are many opportunities for publishing research on games. Uh, in the Harvard Education Review, in the Reading and Writing Quarterly, in the Teachers College Record, there are opportunities. His studies have been um, based on actual experience and you know, there's nothing like interacting with the real world to give people uh, a good sense of what's relevant and what's important as research topics. Um, he taught for a number of years in the Los Angeles area before uh, getting his PhD. His recent book, or his soon to be released book, uh, will be celebrated in about a month. But today he's here to talk to you about some of the studies that he has done uh, with Dungeons and Dragons, looking at role playing and the impact that those experiences have on learning, on collaboration, and on a person's sense of agency. Awesome. And Tarot. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, so I've been in the Graduate School of Education here for exactly one quarter. I started in January. This is the, my first time in this building. I get lost on this campus all of the time. Um, so thank you all for finding me. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, my, my background is as a literacies researcher. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I understand gaming literacies. And then I'm going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, particularly in our current sociocultural context. Um, to do that, I'm going to start with a lengthy book quote, because I'm a, a lit nerd. Um, so I'm going to read this out loud for some of you. I'm going to read it out loud for all of you, but for those of you who are uh, inclined to listen, uh, I'm, the, the quote is, and could Henry sit idly by and watch the kid get powdered, lose hope of becoming an ace? He had to. I was sure he was free to throw away the dice, run the game by whim, but, but, then where would, what, but then what would be the point of it? Who would Damon Rutherford really be then? Nobody, an empty name, a play actor. Even though he'd set his own rules, his own limits, and though he could change them whenever he wished, nevertheless, he and his players were committed to the turns of the mindless and unpredictable, one might even say irresponsible dice. That was how it was. He had to accept it or quit the game altogether. Uh, and this is uh, Robert Coover, he's a novelist. This is his second novel, uh, 1968. Uh, it is about a game that is like uh, Stratomatic. Has anyone played Stratomatic? Uh, not, not so much in the digital age, thank you. Uh, Stratomagic is uh, a dice-based version of playing baseball using real player stats. So if you wanted to find out uh, how a team today would pit, play against uh, Babe Ruth back in the day, you could play an entire season and see what happens, right? Uh, and it's interesting to think through the kinds of ways that embodiment and, and identity and imagining who these players could be through the simple roll of a dice um, continues today in online worlds. Um, so I've been, the, this quote I, I ponder um, essentially, Robert Coover's novel, uh, The Universal Baseball Association Incorporated, J. Henry Wow, pr uh, proprietor, um, is, a, is a story about this character, Henry, who gets lost in the world of baseball um, and just rolling dice and imagining what those dice mean and kind of loses himself from the, the real world around him, um, much as people bemoan uh, in today's society. Uh, so, thinking, so thinking about that, um, I'm interested today in thinking about systems and layers of gaming, uh, and I'll get to Dungeons and Dragons in a couple minutes. Um, but to do that, from a gaming perspective, I'm interested in uh, what do we mean when we talk about a game? Um, and particularly, what are gaming literacies? So I'm going to do like a quick one minute background of what I mean by gaming literacies. Uh, this is the new London group. Um, they are a group of literacies researchers. For those of you who study literacies like me, this is uh, the Beatles. Uh, for literacies research. They might not look like the Beatles to all of you, um, but they are, they are a big deal in, in the small academic world that I inhabit. Um, and over 20 years ago now, they wrote an article that's published in the Harvard Education Review titled, A Pedagogy of Multiliteracies, Designing Social Futures. And this has kind of been a, like a foundational text uh, for how literacies researchers think about the world today. Uh, for me, I'm really interested in the language of designing 
right, and the language of social futures. I think these are really useful to think through literacies and constructing meaning and thinking about possibilities around literacies. Um, but what's actually happened is most people have emphasized multi-literacies, right? They've missed the other parts of this title. Uh, and in doing that, what, what it means is that the past two decades have focused on digital literacies rather than designing and social futures. We've kind of missed the point here uh, with multi-literacies. So while the New Lending Group had this very forward future forward and future facing article, we've kind of grounded it down to digital literacies. Okay, so that's all the literacy stuff for now. That's, that's a good enough piece to know kind of where I'm grounded in thinking about uh, games today. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about a game? Is a game the console, right? Is it this kind of black box uh, in which uh, a game is mediated? Is a game the board on which things are experienced? Isn't in here play Pandemic or, or other nerdy board games? Awesome, there's like two, there's like one nerd and it's right there, this is great, nice, thank you for coming and over here. Um, is the game in the controllers and it's in our kind of physical movements and in the ways that we manipulate objects? Is the game the thing in our brain, right? Or is it in kind of the brains around other people, right, and it's in this shared experience? Um, and so these are questions that I've been trying to think through is where is the game? Uh, Richard Garfield, who's a famous game designer, imagined creating a game that was bigger than the box that it inhabited. Uh, so he ended up creating Magic the Gathering. Uh, for those of you who haven't played Magic the Gathering, uh, it is a collectible car, uh, trading card game. Uh, so there's various rarities, and in order to play the game, you have to buy, there's a whole capitalist undertone to the game, uh, which is a whole other conversation, right? Um, but the game is expansive beyond, you buy a box of cards for Magic the Gathering or a couple of packs, and then you continue to explore, and it, it creates its own ecosystem or market, which is also problematic. Um, but it's useful to think through a game that is bigger than the box in which the game is ca carried. Uh, in, in addition to thinking about a game that's bigger than its box, I want to think about a game that's bigger than the Magic Circle. Uh, the Magic Circle is kind of a foundational idea in gaming research. And the Magic Circle says that when we play a game, we're, we're kind of cordoned off in this circle that's set aside from traditional social norms. So for example, uh, if all of us got up, and so you don't do it, but if all of us got up and kind of got in a circle and did Ring Around the Rosie, uh, and we knew we were doing that, that would be an okay thing to do because we're in this magic circle that says the social norms of running around a circle and falling down at the appropriate time is okay. Um, versus if you just started doing that in the middle uh, of the Stanford campus, you would be seen very differently, right? Although it's a college campus, so people just do crazy things on campus all the time. Um, if you were to do that in other kinds of spaces, the social norms aren't there. Um, but some of the gaming that I've been involved in um, pushes on this magic circle and kind of blurs these boundaries. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a flyer from when I was a high school English teacher. Um, and if you can't see the text, it says, lost Pufftron sensor boxes. If found, and it's got a cloud with 25 blinking eyes. Uh, if found, please call this number. Uh, and the reward is free breakfast. Uh, and so this poster was up in my classroom the first day of school for 12th graders in South Central Los Angeles. Um, the students were, I was going through the syllabus being the typical boring teacher, you know, welcome to 12th grade English, blah, blah, blah. Um, and a student pointed to this poster uh, and then said, Mr. Garcia, uh, and then pointed to this box that was on my desk, uh, which doesn't quite look like this picture, but it's definitely a cloud with 25 blinking eyes. Um, and, the, and the student said, Mr. Garcia, is that the, I'm like, I don't, you know that you're in 12th grade, you need to, need to grow up, right? we need to be serious here. Uh, and the student said, but it's free breakfast, right? Which I, I hear, as a former college student, I hear the call of free food. Uh, and so I said, fine, just call the number real quick. The person calls the number, um, and the person on the other line said, that's so great, uh, I found it, I, I'll come pick it up tomorrow. Um, how many people should I bring free breakfast for? And the student said, 37, because we had a big class. Um, the next day, this guy, he was a hippie, and he knew he was a hippie because he didn't wear shoes. This was the way we developed characters for this game. Showed up with this basket of croissants, um, then basically asked the students to figure out what does this box do? And all of these, uh, I don't think this thing works. Uh, all of the, the lights up here measure different kinds of things. They measure light, they measure sound, uh, they measure temperature, they measure carbon dioxide, and they measure volatile organic compounds, or that kind of smell uh, in, a, in a Sharpie. Uh, and so it's measuring air quality, right? The, the, the technology of the boxes is now on uh, Google streetcars. Um, but what happened was students started playing this game in the real world, and there's a narrative tied to it, right? It wasn't just that they were measuring air quality, they were measuring air quality because there's a big cloud 
that was communicating with them through Twitter, right? And what happened is, as you know, the pollution in Los Angeles is very bad, and it's so bad that it's developed its own consciousness and was using Twitter to tell my students uh, how to improve the air quality around them. Um, and so again, we're trying to challenge what the magic circle was about. Martha mentioned this, and so this is a book that's coming out in a couple weeks um, that's exploring what alternate reality games can be, right? What happens when you play a game that's layered on top of the real world rather than cordoned off within a box or within a screen? What happens when we're playing a game right now, right? Um, so this is a continuation of that space. Okay. So when you think about a game that's bigger than the box or a game that's bigger than the magic circle, and what about a game that's bigger than the actual game? Um, returning to Richard Garfield, the guy who invented Magic the Gathering, uh, he's talked in terms of his own game design practices about the metagame, right, or how a game interfaces outside of itself. Uh, another, I'm not a Richard Garfield shell, by the way, but I'm gonna share one other game by him. He's been a very active game designer. Um, he's created a card game called Netrunner. You play either a corporation or a hacker trying to hack into that corporation through cards. Um, Netrunner is in an interesting moment right now because people are very upset about the kinds of decisions the publishers of Netrunner have made in terms of the story, in terms of the power of the cards. And so uh, the, the Reddit uh, Netrunner community uh, and local metas, right, the local meta games in different communities around the world are struggling to try to figure out the place of players within this larger meta game. Right? There's an interesting moment to think through the meta game of games. And so when we think about what is the game, Right? I would argue that the conversation around the game right, and the way Netrunner in this example interfaces with other people and how it talks and mediates relationships is still a part of the game. Right? Long before you actually play the game, you're playing a game. The game. You're playing a game. Okay, so I, I'm realizing I'm a, I'm a few minutes in this talk and I haven't actually told you where the game is, and so I apologize. Um, so I'm gonna give you one more piece of uh, literacies researcher, research. Uh, Jim G, who is one of the guys in that new London group, uh, he's the guy with the bushy eyebrows, um, talked about a uh, big G game versus a little G game, right? And so the little G game is the thing that we usually consider the game, right? It's that specific and granular play experience, right? It's when you roll the dice on the board, it's when you're playing Mario World 1, Level 1, and you're about to get the extra life mushroom over there, um, versus the big G game, which is a little G game and the meta game together, right? This is Gen Con. Uh, it is a gaming convention that happens in Indianapolis every summer. Uh, there are over 60,000 people that show up to this space. Uh, it is, you know, four days of nerdery. Uh, I go there for research, uh, which my wife gives me the hardest time for. I, I get it. Um, and so we can think through these two different kinds of spaces of a big G game, right? It's these, the kind of larger world that a game takes place in, and the little G game that we kind of discreetly play within. I'd also just add, I've been thinking about platforms. Um, Nick Montfort and Ian Bogust have talked about this idea of platform studies. So if you've ever wanted to read a whole book on the Wii U system, congratulations, they have a book on it. Uh, and you could, you could read about different systems of play and how those systems mediate different kinds of experiences, right? That the kinds of decisions that, were that went into making um, a Wii or making the, the, the new Nintendo Switch system, right? create different forms of play than, a different, than your laptop, than an iPhone, than an Xbox, right? All of these create different kinds of affordances and they have different costs implied within them. So we should be thinking about the platforms and how those shape games and their experiences, right? And as we think about those platforms, is that the game, right? Is the platform itself the game? Um, so my approach to thinking about gaming literacies to then move into Dungeons and Dragons uh, is about thinking about these layered approaches, right? And so here's the layers that I've been thinking about for gaming literacies. Right? We have the little G game, and then we have a platform around it, right? so that mediates this little G game, uh, which might be, the platform could be a digital platform, or again, it could be a board, it could be the card system for Magic the Gathering, uh, it, could, it could be you know, various kinds of things. Right? Um, is, it, is a game, are gaming literacies the manipulation, the interaction between the player the, and the platform? Right? Is this where the game is? Um, is it with the community in which you play the game? Or is it the sociocultural context of play, right? So if I think about the broader society in which games are engaged in, right? And part of that is, you know, we live in America in 2017 and what's happening in the world today and there's executive orders. All of these different pieces mediate what it means to play a game today versus playing a game 20 years ago versus playing a game in a different part of the world or as a different person, right? Um, I w if you look at gaming research and particularly educational gaming research, which is kind of the home I spend a lot of time in, 
most research tends to focus either on these affinity groups, right? How do communities learn and collaborate with one another? Or they look at how are people learning within the little g game, right? I'd argue that these other spaces typically aren't mediated and thought about within the research spaces. And so it's been part of what I've been trying to untangle. Uh, and most specifically, I've been interested in how does culture influence the games we play, right? That's been my emphasis, and I'll get to the, uh, the specifics in a moment. Um, but the key takeaway here is that culture shapes play, right? And play ultimately shapes culture, right? There's an exchange here, right? And so the people who are making games don't make them kind of divorced from the rest of the world like they're on the island and lost or something, right? They, they, are, they make these games as part of and participants in the everyday world, right? So if we think about um, a game like Everything, right, which is a new game where you can play everything, um, then that game was made by people who define everything based on their lived experience as a person in Western society, right? And then we think of all of these different layers around that. Um, as a researcher, I get to read about games, but I don't actually have time to play games. Uh, so I got to read a lot about Firewatch. Did anyone play Firewatch? Awesome, there's more hands than, you guys should play some board games, by the way. Uh, those of you who, who played these games, but not play some board games, it's great. Um, in reading about Firewatch and this kind of the, the ludic experience around Firewatch, um, I appreciated a quote from a YouTube channel uh, that said, the most fulfilling part of playing the game is in the conversations had after the game is done, they thrive on the viscerally gray in the world and outside of it, right? That part of the experience of playing a game like this uh, or listening to a podcast or seeing a film where it doesn't just have to be games is the experience of being uh, engaged with other people, right? Being social with other people around these games, right? And so I think about the sociocultural context of play shaped my experience and I'm able to say, hey, you know, what was really interesting was when I was playing this game and I made this decision and here's a photo, right? I'm able to tell this experience and build meaning with you, right? Uh, educational researcher John Dewey would talk about this dialogue as a place for building, for intellectual engagement. I think that's an important piece for us to be thinking about here, right? Uh, another literacy researcher, critical literacy researcher that I appreciate it, is Paolo Freire and his work with Donaldo Macedo on literacies in the 80s. Uh, they, they frame this idea of reading the word and reading the world. And one thing that I think literacies researchers haven't talked about uh, is a key quote that they talk about that in order to read the word, right, we must first understand and read the world. And what they mean by that is this idea that my understanding of text, my understanding of Firewatch, my understanding of Magic the Gathering, uh, of, of any kind of game is first mediated by my cultural understanding of the world around me, right? My lived experience, right? And, and when I say reading, it's about embodying, about feeling the world, about seeing the space, interactions with other people. Those are what shape who I am. So for example, when I was teaching in South Central Los Angeles, um, We'd given kids mobile, uh, we'd given, we gave kids mobile phones uh, to do some data collection. Uh, and we basically told students that anytime they ate a snack, they should log it on their device, and then we're gonna look at student nutrition practices. I think we're gonna shame kids about the junk they're eating. Um, it wasn't the best approach. Um, but what we found was kids weren't using the app the way that uh, us as middle class adults assumed they would use it, and the reason that happened uh, was Students in South Central Los Angeles and in East Los Angeles who are primarily in working class communities, don't, you, they don't eat snacks, right? Every food they eat is a part of a meal, right? So they were, their understanding of snack was culturally mediated in ways that my understanding of snack wasn't, right? And so this was an experience that, like Firewatch, is culturally grounded in our understanding. Okay, so the literacy implications, so I can get to Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, there are digital literacies and there are gaming literacies and usually we conflate these two, right? We usually think about uh, digital literacies and gaming literacies as the same thing and they're not. Uh, so I would argue that we should be thinking about reading within games. We should be thinking about reading about games and the kind of meta reading that happens around games. We should think about reading across games and this is kind of transmedia examples that happen from one game to one film to another to that crazy Warcraft film, what was that about? Um, to reading alongside, right, and we can think about in parallel to games uh, and reading for context to better understanding what's happening in games. Um, as an English teacher, I'm, I'm also interested in all of the writing stuff with that but I think the reading side is, is easier to just kind of parse um, for, for uh, quickly. Um, we should also be thinking about the sociocultural approaches to platforms, right? That these aren't just about technical stuff, it is also about understanding the cultural spaces around us. Uh, so some implications for this. Uh, this is the Critical Design and Gaming School. Uh, it is a public school I helped open in South Central Los Angeles before I moved to Colorado where I was doing work for a few years. Uh, and this school is based on principles of gameplay and game design. 
uh, and it's open right now. They're probably, uh, it's probably not raining down in Los Angeles right now. Um, and so this is a space where we're interested in practices of gameplay to create dispositions for learning and, and lifelong engagement. Likewise, my, my uh, participation with alternate reality games has led to uh, further uh, analyses of what that looks like in South Central Los Angeles. There's another book that's coming out later this year. Um, I, I should sell more. There's another book that's coming out later this year. Um, and so I'm interested in the sociocultural focus in these pieces and the analog turns. So I want to talk very briefly about analog. Uh, to do that, I want to tell you about Aretha Franklin. Uh, she's a pretty good singer. If you haven't heard of her, uh, this is probably the greatest album ever, uh, ever created. Uh, this is called Young, Gifted, and Black by Aretha Franklin. Uh, this is a song uh, that was written by Nina Simone in tribute to Angela Hansberry uh, that, was that was based on a play Raisin in the Sun that was based on a Langston Hughes poem. Like, the lineage around this album is incredible. Um, you kids these days, right? Like, you should just go listen to this album if you haven't heard this album. It's great. Um, I listen to this album as a CD, right? This is analog, and so this, this, is, or this is a record, um, and we can think about the kind of grooves that, that, are, that a, a record needle moves through to play a song, right? And, and it kind of treads this space to create music and create meaning. Um, and so this is analog, right? There's kind of a wave that things move through, and there's a spectrum, uh, and there's, there's an infinity between one and zero in an analog world um, versus a digital world that approximates that, right? Uh, so digital, right, this is, this is kids these days and their MP3 files or their, uh, their title. Is that, is that something people pay for? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, and so I want to recognize there's some differences, right, that digital is about digits and discrete digits from one to another, and analog is kind of about this, this flow from one to another. And so digital is an approximation of the analog world we live in, right? And so while I appreciate this version of the Aretha Franklin album, right, and all of the songs on it, um, if we zoom into it, right, we can think about, I, I, I got a digital approximation of this image online. We can think about how the resolution of this image is approximated, right? And, and there's, there's some challenges here when we talk about digital literacies, right? We're talking about approximating what the experiences are in an analog world. Okay, so all of that to be said, uh, I was trying to figure out what all of this means, so I stepped into the field um, to stop worrying about digital gaming literacies and video game spaces and think about gaming literacies and analog spaces playing Dungeons and Dragons, a tabletop role playing game. As I was doing this research, uh, we saw that systems were slowly failing around us and predictions around systems were failing. We also found that a lot of uh, primarily men on, t on TV don't know how to use touch screens, which was a good learning experience. Um, we were also seeing other kinds of systems thrive and, and systems of organizing and networks emerging organically um, to push on the kinds of real world context happening around us. And so I was feeling this kind of frustration around uh, being in, in a primarily white community in northern Colorado and seeing spaces around the country, around the world, uh, engaged in different kinds of ways that systems were, uh, I think, failing in some sense. Uh, so I made two assumptions when I went into this research about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, the first is, there's powerful learning that happens in digital games. Um, there's a lot of research on World of Warcraft and the kind of complex literacy practices that happen in these spaces. Uh, there's EVE Online and the ways that collaboration happens in these spaces. Uh, there is uh, analyses of uh, civic engagement and protest in places like Second Life uh, and The Sims. Uh, there's the fact that you can build a computer, uh, you can build a working calculator in Minecraft which I think means at some point you can build a computer that will play Minecraft inside of Minecraft, uh, which then you just have to lay down and, and ponder your life choices, I think. Um, so there's a lot of powerful stuff that can happen in games. But the other assumption uh, is that people can be pretty terrible to one another in online spaces like games. Right? Uh, we can think about the experiences that Anita Sarkeesian's been very uh, vocal about. Uh, she runs a popular online website, Feminist Frequencies, uh, that explores the tropes that women are portrayed in, in video games. Uh, and she's uh, received death threats uh, and has gotten hate and is a part of uh, an ongoing response from, from the Gamergate community, right? Which essentially is oppressive to, there, there's a lot of things that Gamergate is, right? But I would say um, that is a particularly violent towards uh, women and people of color and the LGBTQ community involved within gaming culture, right? So thinking about all this digital stuff, I was interested in the table, right? What happens when we remove all the digital stuff and we have to sit down and play a game with one another face to face, right? We, have to be, we probably have to be civil, we probably have to talk to one another, probably have to make eye contact, there's probably smiling and snacks and sugar all involved in these things. Um, 
And so Alice Waters, uh, the farm to table person up in Berkeley, uh, she says the table is a civilizing place. It's where a group comes and they hear points of view. They learn about courtesy and kindness. They learn about what it is to live in a community, live in a family first, but live in a bigger community. And I think this is a key thing to think about with games, is what community are we learning within and what are the ways that we're socializing with each other. So to do that, uh, I then turned to the nerdiest bookshelf I've ever uh, assembled for research. Uh, these were my research texts. Uh, and so these are all, this is what a tabletop role-playing game looks like. Right? There, there are several hundred page tomes uh, with tables and charts and they're, they're usually poorly written. Um, it's, it's great, it's sort of this English teacher in me. Um, and so these are books right, that guide forms of play in virtual world spaces. So let's define role-playing games really, really quickly. Um, in order to define what a role-playing game is, we actually need to define Dungeons and Dragons. So what happened was, in 1974, Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax uh, were in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, uh, and they decided that their friends in their basement would come together and they would play this game by rolling dice and nerding out in ways that we might have some assumptions about what that looks like, and we'll look at those in a second. Um, they created a game called Dungeons and Dragons in 1974. Uh, it sold very well. Other people wanted to copy it and make their own versions of Dungeons and Dragons, but they can't say, here's our version of Dungeons and Dragons, because then they'd get sued, because that's not something they could do. So people invented their own system. They called it, I created a role-playing game, which was, role-playing game was basically a way to say a game like Dungeons and Dragons without getting sued and saying like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so when we talk about role-playing games, that language comes from the fact that people couldn't say a game like Dungeons and Dragons, and it got uh, appropriated over time to talk about a large genre, right? But the first tabletop role-playing game was Dungeons and Dragons, uh, and in the, uh, the second revised edition of it, Gary Gygax describes Dungeons and Dragons as, bless you, a fantasy game of role-playing which relies upon the imagination of participants for it is certainly make-believe, yet it is so interesting, so challenging, so mind-unleashing that it comes near reality, right? And the idea is that together we will collectively create a world and live and experience and build stories within this world together. Since then, we can think about things like Game of Thrones being influenced by this. Uh, George R. R. Martin played uh, Dungeons and Dragons with uh, several Dungeons and Dragons designers. Um, interestingly, he played with someone named uh, Ned Stark. Uh, there was a character in the first book who dies, they all die, uh, who had his name very similar to that. Uh, when you think about the beginning of Stranger Things and how this is also seeped in a culture of Dungeons and Dragons, when you think about World of Warcraft and the idea of leveling, of hit points, if you've ever heard of these tropes in games, or of having a fighter and a priest and a mage. These are all tropes that came out of Dungeons and Dragons in the 1970s. Uh, when think about freaks and geeks, uh, and the typical image is of nerdy white boys playing Dungeons and Dragons together. Right? This is usually what we think about when we think about, uh, in pop culture, who plays Dungeons and Dragons. But I'd point out that um, both Juno Diaz and Tanahisi Coates have both talked about Dungeons and Dragons being formative to their experiences and the ways that they're able to tell stories today. Right, so there's a, there's a more diverse body of participants, but we'll get to uh, maybe why that's been limited uh, in general. Um, and so while Dungeons & Dragons was created 40 years ago, uh, the gaming community around it hasn't stayed static. Right? We still, there are still a lot of people who mainly play with dice, um, but the, game, the, the space has been uh, very engaged in online crowdfunding sources. Kingdom Death, which is built off of Dungeons & Dragons tropes, uh, recently made over $12 million on Kickstarter. Uh, there are a lot of podcasts that do actual plays where you listen to people play these uh, games together. Uh, there are online systems for storytelling and play, uh, and there are ways to approximate the tabletop experience in online spaces. I actually think these are still pretty terrible, uh, but they're getting closer, right? Uh, there's still something I think about being social together, and so a lot of people just use things like Skype or Google Hangouts to sit around together face-to-face -face in a digital context and still play these games. So as I was going to these spaces, I wanted to go back through all of those texts on that bookshelf and do some understanding. And so the questions I was asking myself are, how are gender, race, and power defined explicitly and implicitly within the systems of D&D, right? So if this is the root of role-playing games, right, how did these define gender and race in ways that would then lead towards other games and towards the gaming industry? Because if you look at early video game designers, they were all playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? The crew that were creating Doom, right, which is also the first, player, first, uh, first person shooter, right? Um, when they weren't designing levels for that game, they were playing Dungeons and Dragons. We can think about these parallel efforts that are happening together. Uh, and also one of the key level designers for Doom, uh, Sandy Peterson, created another popular role-playing game, Call of Cthulhu, um, based off of pulp stories. 
Uh, and uh, another question, uh, how do these constructions reflect the influences on the system? And also, how do these constructions shape player experience within and around the D&D &D virtual world, right? So these are the questions that were leading me into this work. And the whole point of this was, I just spent two years doing research, playing games with all of these other nerds. Uh, and so I wanted to inform the way I was understanding our interactions based on what the systems had already driven us towards, what kinds of dispositions had they created for us. Uh, to do that, I want to think about virtual worlds uh, as this kind of uh, place of kind of scuba diving, right? That when we go into a virtual world, we, we kind of go underwater and we look at the entire world underneath us, but eventually we have to come up for air and come back to the real world. This could be uh, if you're playing World of Warcraft, this could be if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, uh, this could be if you are engaged in fan fiction communities, right? Anytime you, you kind of step into this alternate world and then you come back up, um, there are a lot of uh, ethnographies in, in digital virtual worlds, right? So if you're interested in thinking about Second Life, uh, Tom Bolstorff has a book, Coming of Age in Second Life. Constance Steinkohler has looked at lineage. Uh, Bonnie Nardi has a great book called My Life as a Night Priest Elf. Uh, and there's a book on communities of play uh, in the mist online uh, virtual worlds, right? And these, these are pervasive worlds where people build relationships and meaning and collaboration and learn together. And so building off of this tradition, rather than thinking about digital spaces, I was interested in thinking about what happens in these pervasive virtual worlds uh, that are constructed uh, in people's minds and on, on, uh, with paper and pen. Um, to do that, uh, I was thinking about systems, right? These are books filled with tables. Uh, so I wanted to recognize that uh, systems attract systems people, right? That people who like the kinds of forms of play that are built into these systems are going to continue to play these systems. Um, but even though these are about systems and tables and numbers, uh, they are still tables and numbers that were made by people at the end of the day, right? Um, that the decisions around when you roll an 18, it means this thing happens, right? Were made, they were made by a dude, right? It was made by this guy, Gary Gygax, in 1974. He made that decision. And so it's not like some, arbi it's an arbitrary rule. It's not some kind of dictated rule from above. It's another person just like you and I that made these systems. And so we need to recognize that. Okay, so in order to ex explore systems, methodologically, I just read all of the Dungeons and Dragons stuff. There's a lot of other systems out here, but recognizing that Dungeons and Dragons was what started role-playing games and is what then led towards the other games and what led towards ways we understand games in video uh, and digital environments, I started with Dungeons and Dragons and read all of the editions of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, these are the editions of Dungeons and Dragons that were available. There's the first version, 1974, uh, Four years, or three years later, there are two versions that were forked. Uh, there is an advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and there's a basic version to get people uh, to, to better understand the game more quickly. And then you could see there's a second edition that came out in the 80s. Uh, they re-revised the second edition. And we think through the ways that these different versions um, were one, they, they made the rules clearer in some sense. They also made the rules more complex. And every time a new edition came out, it made sure that a player base had to buy a new set of books, right? It was a way to make sure that the company uh, was always making money. Um, a couple of things to note. Uh, so in 2000, we have the third edition. Uh, 2003, they wanted to fix it, but they didn't want a brand new edition. So we have the 3.5 edition because we're not so good with numbers. Um, and then in 2008, uh, there's the fourth edition, which people really didn't like. Uh, so what happened was in the 3.5 edition, Wizards of the Coast, who was the publisher of Dungeons and Dragons at the time, um, published the game with the OGL, the, the uh, Open Gaming License. And what the Open Gaming License meant is that anybody can publish stuff related to Dungeons and Dragons without using the language, like without using the, the story uh, and named elements in them, right? So if I wanted to publish my own adventure that used the rules of Dungeons and Dragons, I could publish it under the open gaming license uh, and, and include it uh, so other people could use it and share these materials. And I could essentially make my own company publishing third party materials related to the game. Right? They're trying to create uh, and support the fan base in some sense. Um, so what happened was when, people, when the fourth edition came out, which kind of responded to ways that people played in World of Warcraft, the player community did not like those systems changes. Right? And so uh, a new company created Pathfinder. Has anyone here played Pathfinder? Is anyone here a Pathfinder player? Yeah, still awesome nerd. Um, so Pathfinder uh, is basically a third party publisher that said, we're gonna fix the 3.5 rules, the ways that fans wanna play that game, and we're gonna publish our own version, right? So out of all of these, this is the only non-official version of the game. And essentially what they did was uh, this group of fans who's a, who's a company, Paizo Publishing, um, 
put out their own version of Dungeons and Dragons, which was for a while more popular than the actual version of Dungeons and Dragons. Right? Uh, as of right now, the most popular played, uh, the most widely played ver uh, tabletop role-playing game is fifth edition. The second most widely played version is Pathfinder, right? So we have two different versions of D&D that are competing within this space. All that being said, uh, we should just recognize that systems make more systems, right? Uh, this is all uh, embedded within a system of, of capitalism and profit. And so as I was looking at all of these, I was looking at the ways that race and gender are constructed in these spaces. Uh, so I'm going to look at how gender is constructed. Um, before I do that, I want to make a caveat that I was reading books from the 70s to the present and trying to understand meanings of gender as it's depicted in pictures and language. Uh, and so while the books don't acknowledge this, gender is a fluid and complex topic. Um, and so anytime a picture had a, a person or, or a figure that the gender was ambiguous, I would count that person as a female. I wanted to um, give more credence and more assumption that there is gender inclusivity in these books than might have actually been intentioned. Um, so just, just a quick caveat as we're going in there. So findings. Uh, Shockingly, uh, gen just a useful reminder that these are the creators of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is a game that's created by boys with toys uh, who created this game, right? And so there are limited ways that, uh, that Dungeons and Dragons included women in the original systems of the game, right? Uh, in the second version of the game, uh, Gary Gagax writes, D&D players happily come in all shapes and sizes, and even a fair number of women are counted among those who regularly play the game, making Dungeons and Dragons somewhat special in this regard, right? I think that word even um, points to the limited ways that women were included within this game. Uh, it also shows up in the kinds of pronouns that are used throughout the game. Uh, my favorite explanation of this is in the second edition. Um, in the second edition, the opening explains the male pronoun he, him, his is used exclusively throughout the advanced Dungeons & Dragons game rules. We hope this won't be construed by anyone for to be an attempt to exclude females from the game or imply their exclusion. Centuries of use have neutered the male pronoun. In written material, it is clear, concise, and familiar. Nothing else is. I'm not really sure why they had to decide that nothing else is. That seems like a real uh, slight. Um, and none of that's actually true, right? That's, that is someone's decision when they were writing that book, right, in terms of making those decisions. But it's not just the pronouns. Um, in, the, in the first revision of the game, uh, Gygax writes, although the masculine form of appellation is typically used when listing the level titles of the various types of characters, these names can easily be changed to the feminine if desired. This is fantasy. What's in a name? In all but a few cases, sex makes no difference to ability. But it's important to recognize that there are a few cases where sex makes a difference. So for example, uh, women can't actually be as strong as men in the second version of the game, right? Uh, which, so you can, you can play this game where you can fight a dragon, uh, and you can cast spells, and you can fly, um, but they can't actually imagine a world uh, in the 70s where uh, men and women were of equal strength, right? So these are important to recognize. And that this is a revision, right? Those rules weren't in the first edition. They had to add those, right, as the game moved forward. They added in forms of exclusion, right? This is a human-built system to think about. Okay, so then I went through and counted all of the pictures of all of the people in all of the books. Uh, and so I looked at the versions of the books. Every time a picture had a person in it, I counted it, right? And then I would count either how many women were in that picture uh, and how many uh, total women were within the book. So for example, if there's a picture of a bar scene and there's 10 people in that picture uh, and two of them are women, that picture is a picture that has women in it but it's also a picture that still has more men than women, right? So there's some important differences in, in the ways these are displayed. So in the first edition, 22% of the pictures uh, had women in them. Uh, not so great. Uh, that those, number, those percentages actually go down over time. Um, and so even though there are a few pictures with women in them, they are less than flattering, right? Here is two pictures of women uh, in the very first edition of Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, think about our audience for images of a beautiful witch uh, and an Amazon. Um, and so these are still black and white images, but we could, we could imagine uh, how whiteness might also play into these images. Uh, if we look at the 1989 edition, these percentages drop. Right? And so we have even fewer pictures of women, and a couple of the pictures of women continue to show them in uh, diminutive poses of fear. Right? These aren't empowering images of women. Uh, we actually see higher percentages if we look at the basic editions of Dungeons and Dragons. So we wonder who gets to be an advanced player and who gets to be a basic player uh, within the game. Um, 
And we can look at the most recent additions, right? These have shot up dramatically, right? When we think about Pathfinder, right, this, this third party group that's published their own version having the most inclusivity, but then when you look at the total people across all of the pictures, we still don't get to some kind of equal distribution of men and women, right? That there's still women in a lot more pictures, right? But the total number of people just isn't there. And so we should think about, you know, what's that say? What are our assumptions and, and what are our blind spots when we're looking at these representations, right? If we think about the kind of hateful language and representation in Gamergate, right, we could argue that this is part of how that happened, right? These were in the roots that created gaming today, right, were the kinds of exclusion around gender. Moving forward, I want to talk about race. There's two ways to talk about race in Dungeons and Dragons. There's the kinds of cultural understandings of race as we know today, right, and then there are, uh, different races of individuals, which we'll get to in a second. So one thing to recognize is even in fantasy worlds, whiteness is pervasive. This was a game made by white men. Uh, so most of the characters that are portrayed in the books are white men. Uh, and we can think about the Eurocentric gaze that is played within these games. Um, on the other side of this, uh, there are different kinds of races that you could play within the game, right? In the very first edition, it says that most D&D characters are human, um, but a character can also be non-human, a dwarf, an elf, or halfling, uh, they got sued by J.R.R. Tolkien, so they had to change it um, from Hobbit to halfling after the first edition. Um, these are commonly known as demi-humans because they seem to be partially human, right? Uh, so it, I would argue that there is a humanist um, bias in the perspectives here in ways that uh, belittle the, the imagined lived experiences of dwarfs, elves, halflings, and other races that are added over time. Right? So partially human, right? again, we primarily get whiteness in these images. Um, but we can think about what those mean. Right? And the other part of this, though, that's important uh, is thinking about the attitudes. If you're supposed to embody these characters and figure out who you are within these, um, the game notes that the dealings with a character has with various races will be affected by racial preferences to some extent. So oftentimes when I'd sit at the table uh, and play with other people, if someone was a dwarf, they would see an elf who was, play, who was at their table and say, I don't like elves, right? And you are supposed to enact racist practices towards other races within the game, right? If you're a human, you're skeptical of orcs, right? If you're an elf, you don't like dwarves. There is, there is racism built into the system in terms of the attitudes you're supposed to carry with other people. Half-orcs are a useful example of this. Uh, one of the kinds of abilities that you have as a half-orc is you get to have, have a savage attack. Uh, and we can think through what that means, right, and how you became a half-orc, right? You can't play an orc. Orcs are supposedly not smart enough for someone to play within the game. Uh, and so we can think through what is the lineage of, um, uh, of rape and pillaging and violence that have led to becoming a half-orc, right? So in the, in the most recent edition of Dungeons and Dragons, when we should be thinking more inclusively, uh, the half-orc uh, has an ability called grudging accept acceptance. Each half-orc finds a way to gain acceptance from those who hate orcs. And it talks about different strategies that you do that, right? So if you were to play a half-orc within the game, you know that people hate you because you are an orc, not because of any decision you made, but because Dungeons and Dragons is just a racist place to be, right? And again, knowing these dispositions around race, and it's weird for us to talk about race when we talk about racial challenges in the real world, right? When we think about how those are funneled and mediated for people who play this game. So again, we should be thinking about the gaze of this system, right? There's some methodological influences, to, uh, implications to think about. The cultural influence on systems matter, right? Um, Svart and Prusak talk about the identity that uh, identity is created from narratives that are floating around. Um, and also the cultural influences on systems matters at the end of the day. Right? Um, there's an idea that stereotypes and cultural identities follow players into games, but at least my analysis would argue that it also follows us outside of games. So as we think about these, uh, I want to remind us that uh, this doesn't happen as snow globe. Right? All of these depictions of race and gender happen in the real world, and we play these games in the real world. Right? So systems construct culture. This is going to help me inform this stuff. Uh, but more importantly, People live culture. Uh, Chris Gutierrez and Barbara Rogoff talk about this idea that people live culture in a mutually constitutive manner and which is not fruitful to toad up their characteristics as if they occur independently of culture and of culture as if it occurs independently of people, right? So people live culture when they're sitting at the table. People live culture when we watch Alton Sterling's son cry for his daddy who was killed by the police the day before, right? People live culture when we look at the world around us and think about the hate crimes that are happening right now. People live culture when we look at the kinds of activism and engagement that's happening as we resist uh, an autocratic practice that's happening in the government right now. 
right? People live culture when I was talking with teachers the day after the election, and teachers were trying to understand how do I teach when people are going to come together and parents uh, of my students might have voted for Trump and other parents might have voted uh, for Hillary. How do we have these different kinds of conversations, right? So I've been thinking about how people live culture. I've been working with uh, the teacher education community. We've created Slam School, which is a place to use digital tools to understand the world around us. Uh, Slam School are 20 to 30 minute YouTube classes uh, on thinking about how to use digital tools for activism. So later this afternoon, um, my colleague Deonza Rogers, who's a film professor at Cornell, is going to be talking about how do you hold your camera appropriately, very basic, um, to, to um, capture the world around us, right? So if you are on an airplane and you see an injustice, how can you videotape that in an effective manner, right? Uh, if you are at a demonstration uh, in Berkeley over the weekend, how do you capture that in an effective manner? Uh, the other shameless plug I'll make uh, is for on May 23rd, next month, uh, we'll be releasing the alternate reality game uh, collection and having a day-long symposium uh, thinking about alternate reality games in an era of alternative facts. Uh, this is a day-long free event. It'll start in the, the MAP Center. Uh, Jane McGonigal will be our keynote in the, e in the afternoon. Uh, and there'll be a, a big block in the middle of the day if you want to uh, continue to, to head over here. There's some free food. People like free food. Um, but you should, you should join here or tell uh, friends to join here. Uh, I'm going to stop there. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.